Doors are closed up, yeah? Good afternoon. My name is Vasily Tok, and I'm the president of the SSA. Um, welcome to the SSA lectures, and a special welcome to Per Adamson at SMP, and Professor Richard DeMarco, who kindly joined us this afternoon. We invited also the Consul General of Ukraine, who wanted to be here today, but we didn't get any reply yet, so if it comes to we we'll know probably. Um, the first SSA lecture for 2024 is Ukraine, the role of culture in a time of war, delivered by Dr. Charles Hansen Thalbrand, freelance academic and art critic for the Times newspapers in Scotland. Giants received, uh, recently traveled to Ukraine to meet and work with individuals and institutions in the cultural sphere. The lecture reflects on why culture is a vital and important aspect of Ukraine's identity. The lecture looks at definitions of culture and how literature and art in particular help to define and reflect cultural values. Ladies and gentlemen, Giles Sutherland. Thank you, Russell. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank some people here for their help, Russell, for uh, extending the invitation. Uh, my friend Rosanna Bruni, who has come from Italy and uh, helped me in many ways to make the journey. And Diane, Diane Gartner, who, who works here as part of the committee. Uh, Robert Lemay, and uh, Erin, who goes down. Put up your hand, Erin, and keep you your help today. Uh, Keres, who also works here. Uh, my mother, Lise Hansen, who is an artist. Uh, as president of the SSA, uh, has always encouraged me to, to go out of, uh, and look at the world. And the illustration that you see on the right of the screen is one of her series that was completed in Berlin in the 19, early 1990s. Uh, there are some books at the back for who is on sale. I'd also like to thank my friends Rose Strang and Adam Brewster who have been very supportive over the past, uh, past while and Adam is helping to film this event. Uh, I'm very touched that Claire Adamson has come. Um, very nice to see you here. Um, my, my, uh, my journey in life, uh, the intellectual journey would not have been possible without Richard DeMarco, uh, who's, who's here in the audience. I'm very touched that he's here uh, to support this event on the SSA. Uh, at the table at the back of the room, you'll see a PhD, and if you want to kill a cat, <laughs> just drop it. PhD was on Richard's experimental summer school in the 70s called Edinburgh Arts. And I think without Richard's example and inspiration, I wouldn't have gone to Ukraine where he once said in another context where angels fear, fear to tread. Uh, my grandmother, um, Agnes Burns, was born in Kilwinning, not not too far from here. Um, her father was a piper and a shoemaker in that time. The family were all musical and loved poetry and song. And I'd like to think of her as I try to negotiate this particularly difficult um, series of ideas. Um, I'd also like to thank the audience, um, Burns Road, Old Air, which near two surpasses for Honest Men and Bonnie Lasses, and it's very good to see both here today. Um, I made a journey to Ukraine after listening to, as we all have, the news that went on for months and months and 
years. And eventually I couldn't sit there just watching it. I, I felt I had to go. And I have no idea what force impelled me to, to do something like that. Um, but I would say that in the course of 10 days, I learned more about that country and situation than I had done for reading or <coughs> listening or watching for, for nearly two years. I titled the talk, The Importance of Culture in a Time of War, 10 questions to which I do not know the answer. And we'll look at some of these questions. I can't answer all of them. Maybe I can't even ask them. I don't know. On the left side of this illustration, you'll see um, what's known as a hedgehog. And the artist Bank Banksy went out to Ukraine and did one of his uh, humorous, or mostly humorous, takes of children on a seesaw on um, the hedgehog, which is basically a tank trap. So those two images are juxtaposed, but I think they, they complement each other well. Um, a couple of days ago, one of my friends, colleagues in Ukraine wrote to me, sorry I haven't been in touch, been in a bad place, one of my friends was killed. Uh, this is a young man that I'd like to dedicate this lecture to. His name is Maxime Christophe died defending his country. Uh, on the front line. Uh, he was 33 years old. This is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with the death of a generation of talented young people. People much younger than most of us here, younger than me. And they're putting their lives on the line and frequently losing their lives. Uh, once upon a time, in spring of 2014, I fell asleep and didn't wake for a couple of years. My dreams were covered in snow and so cold, just like the palms that were dead near him. Sorry, dead near Isia. I think I didn't wake up, just fell asleep in this long, as a nature, bat snake dream. So, Maxime, um, this is for you. I'd like to tell you a little bit about me. Um, as Vasily said, I work for the Times newspaper um, and I'm a writer. And I've engaged with Ukraine over the years, um, not physically, but spent a lot of time in Poland, where the city of Wrocław, which you may know, um, is basically populated by people from Ukraine, mainly the city of Lviv, or the Wolf, depending on who you are. The city of Lviv has had a, a long history of conflict. It was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and was called Lemberg, and then became a part of the, the Soviet Empire, it was part of the part of Poland, uh, and now is an independent country. Uh, but a lot of people in this country have contributed towards helping Ukraine, not least the artistic community who last year uh, did a fundraiser by selling artworks. And I was happy enough to, to cover that particular event. If you look at the, at the back of this room, you'll see some framed pieces of work. It's a magazine that I used to edit when I was a student called Clan Jamfrey. Uh, that was 40 years ago, so I decided this would be a good time to do a 40th anniversary edition dedicated to Ukraine. And that's basically the reason I went out there to collect poetry and writing and artwork uh, and to meet people Possibly could have done it online, but uh, I believe uh, in meeting people. And the 
of somehow a connection that, that cannot be made over, a, over a Zoom or whatever you choose. It's a very different thing actually meeting people in the flesh. So I'm organising an event in June of this year at the Scottish Poetry Library. We will have a new edition of Plan Jamfrey bilingual. It will not be in English. It will be in the language of Burns and my grandmother, the Scots language. And the reason for that is that Ukrainians understand uh, the difference between the Russian language and what it represents and the Ukrainian language and they go immediately what I was saying about the relationship between English and Scots. I don't mean the people, I'm talking about the language. So uh, that would be the language that the Ukrainian is translated into. <coughs> there are many, many interesting connections between Scotland and Ukraine. Uh, the Donbass, for example, uh, a mining industrial <coughs> area, uh, was basically uh, set up by Scots and Welsh, uh, who lent their mining <coughs> engineering skills to that part of eastern Ukraine. But there are many literary and artistic connections, and one of those uh, is this year, the Krena, who lived um, in the latter part of the 19th century and died just before the First War. And one of her early but best known poems is a poem about Robert Bruce. And I learned uh, that in the Beef, uh, I think three days ago, there was a performance of the poem under the auspices of the Leaf, uh, UNESCO City of Literature. And an honour that it shares with Edinburgh. So there are strong links and many, many reasons why we should care. We should care about these people. They're not far away and they're not different. Two other influences. Um, on the left is the student newspaper from Edinburgh University from 1982. And on the right, a book by Neil Atchison. I'm sure most of you know about Neil's work. He's a, a prominent intellectual journalist, historian. Uh, and he covered uh, that region for several decades and was um, in Poland in the 80s. I went to Poland in 1989 and uh, there was a club that I used to go to for journalists uh, and it stopped the Observer newspaper. God knows how it got there, but it, it did get there. And maybe out of some kind of whimsy, I decided to write to Neil and to my amazement, he wrote back. And he encouraged me to, um, to do what I do, in fact, to pursue writing. But this is from 1982, and it's a lecture that Neil was uh, invited to give by the students' uh, union there on being a foreign correspondent. I look back at that lecture as a kind of pivotal point in my life. Neil mentioned a phrase the episodic consciousness. And never has that been more apt and relevant than today. We've now become used to the news media and the way that they treat world events. We've now moved from Ukraine, from Gaza, we're now, I don't know where we are, Yemen. Next week it will be something else and so on and so forth. But there are people dying now in Ukraine there are people dying in many other places too. But the episodic consciousness is um, the phrase that, that I remember when I was 18 years old. And I remember thinking, that's something that we need to combat because there's, 
there's a continuity there. Uh, the events that are well reported are still happening. And we are, would be well advised to remember that. This is the, the title of, of the, the PhD. It's called On the Road to Miko Segi. And I'd like to think that Mikos, the road to Miko Segi extends to Ukraine. I'm sure Richard would agree with that one. Uh, the road is Richard's um, device for describing the journey, not just the physical journey, uh, but the intellectual journey that we make through life. And I had this poem in mind when I was making the last journey, we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started in no place for the first time. Through the unknown, unremembered gate, when the last of earth left to discover is that which was the beginning, the source of the longest river, the voice of the hidden waterfall, and the children in the apple tree. That's T.S. Eliot, I'm sure you all know. I asked 10 questions. <coughs> I don't know how to answer them. I don't even know how to ask them, but I think they're questions that we all need to ask each other um, and ourselves. What's culture and why do we value it? At what point does culture become politicized? What is the role of culture in a time of war? And does that, the role, change? And what, is, what part can writers and artists in particular play? Is there a limit to free speech? Um, particularly in Ukraine, I've noticed a great increase, an upsurge in cultural activity. Why? Is cultural activity as a propaganda tool something that is legitimate? And lastly, have the writers of Ukraine somehow become the voice for the politicians and the diplomats and the military? The etymology of culture is based in the idea of tilling the land. Uh, that, is, that is the root. But of course it became associated with the idea of civilization and development. The Oxford Dictionary has a lot to say about it, um, but the meaning that I'm dealing with here uh, is a particular form or type of intellectual development to do with civilization, customs, artistic achievements of a people, especially at a certain stage of their development or history. I remember reading this book and not particularly understanding it when I was a student. My T.S. Eliot began the definition of culture, but I asked my old friend, Chat G.P.T., <laughs> to give me a helping hand because I couldn't remember much about the book. But basically, Eliot um, saw culture as something that's multifaceted. Um, and encompass not only the arts, but values, beliefs, and traditions. Um, and it goes well beyond the superficial or decorative. They also argue that humanity needs tradition, and that culture is rooted there, and that a healthy culture is one that respects and maintains its historical and intellectual heritage. He, he also argued that culture needs a deep understanding of the past. And so it, it's about the integration of the individual and society. Uh, culture gives us a sense of community and a sense of shared values. And it plays a vital role in 
integrating individuals into society and providing a framework for human relationships. So thank you, Chat GPT. Uh, when I went to Ukraine, I realized I was dealing with uh, a highly sophisticated culture, uh, one that valued art in, in, in all its uh, expressions, uh, one that valued it enough to protect, to protect it from bombs and drone attacks. And I went to visit the, uh, the director of the National Galleries in Lviv, and they had completely evacuated the entire National Galleries in Lviv across 14 sites. Everything had been taken out of the country. Uh, and there were temporary exhibitions there. Everyone was wearing their overcoats because they cut down the power and the lights but the staff was still there. And I thought, this is a country that takes their, their art seriously enough to protect it in that way. This is a poem that W.H. Auden wrote uh, about 1940. Uh, it was in memory of Yeats, W.B. Yeats. Addressing Yeats, he said, I was wondering if you would mind turning your phone off, please, whoever that is. Thank you. Uh, you were silly like us. Your gift survived at all. A parish of rich women, physical decay. Yourself. Mad Ireland hurt you into poetry. Now Ireland has her madness and her weather still, for poetry makes nothing happen. It survives at the valley of its making where executives would never want to tamper. It flows on south from branches of isolation and the busy griefs, raw towns, and we believe in dying and survives and we have happening in my mouth. I don't agree with that. I think poetry does make things happen. It just doesn't make them happen. And the way that other things do, but it all makes things happen in the minds of people who read it. Uh, it makes people feel, and it makes them think. But he appears to contradict himself, because on the fateful day of September 1st, 1939, he was living in the United States, and he wrote this, defenseless under the night, our world is in stupor bodies, yet dotted everywhere, Ironic points of light flash out wherever the just exchange their messages. May I, composed like them, of heroes and of dust, beleaguered by the same negation and despair, show an affirming flame. An affirming flame, that is what poetry can do. It can affirm our values, our culture, and our humanity. Everyone knows this poem, I think, but it's, it's again by Yeats, uh, and it was written in that strange period between the end of the First War and the beginning of the Irish Civil War. Turning and turning in the widening jar, the falcon cannot bear the falconer. Sorry, the falcon cannot hear the falconer, things fall apart. The centre cannot hold, mirarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dim tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passion and intensity. I don't think I can think of any better words to describe our current plight in the world. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passion and intensity. I won't name names, but I'm sure you can think of some. Um, when I was in Ukraine, I was privileged to meet an extraordinary man uh, on the right, 
Nigel Osborne, well known to Richard and some other people here too, he was an emeritus professor of music at Emory University and he worked in Bosnia in the 90s. And this is him with culture fighting Serbian snipers as he plays in the rooms of um, a theatre in Sarajevo. There are people at that room at that minute that photograph was taken uh, actually trying to shoot him and his, and his colleague um, Vedran Smelovic. And that is about the most defined image I can think of about what culture means and why culture is important and why we have to fight fascism not only with with guns but with what we think of as our common humanity. Many authoritarian regimes are afraid of culture and you've heard of Russian Russian journalists and writers being imprisoned and we've seen deliberate targeting of Ukrainian intellectuals being murdered as well uh, and we all know that Plato thought that uh, poets should be part of the Republic. This is a ledger from uh, Cobbles in 1937 listing the kind of people like that should be uh, classified as degenerate. Mm. Nigel's been working with trauma victims in Ukraine, traveling around by train in his 70s, working with soldiers and with children who are orphaned most of them have what we now call post-traumatic stress disorder. But he has done a lot of work in terms of uh, the mechanics and psychology of music as a way of actually restructuring the mind uh, and lessening the effects of trauma. I'm just going to play you a short film. I hope that the brain ones no, I have to do it in This is an article, I didn't write it, but um, it was written by a friend uh, of Andrew Susan Nichols, the journalist in the Times. Uh, just 
just a few weeks ago. And uh, it's talking about his work out there. Uh, if you get a chance, please try to, to look, look it up and try to support what's happening. I met uh, a lot of people in Ukraine, but I think the most, uh, in some ways, the most meeting was with a young man. His name is Arthur Drum. He's 22. Uh, he was a publisher, working in a publishing firm, and he signed up. Uh, and since that time, he's been on the front line, coming back and forward to his home city of the week. And one of his books has just been published, his first book. So I met him there. Uh, I didn't want to show you all the, the images because they're, I think they're just too upsetting, but um, he took me to what they call the Field of Mars, which is a cemetery, a new cemetery in the week. Um, 2,000 new graves. The images were well, the graves were decorated often with photographs, very recent photographs, and all the people that I could see were in their twenties and thirties. And he took me around uh, to <coughs> to look at this uh, the people in his unit. So we stopped at I don't know half a dozen graves. Uh, they had football insignia or things that referenced the person who died and we said some prayers at the graves. I felt quite intrusive. Uh, there was a family there who were burying, I don't know who, their son or daughter. Uh, I, I didn't think that I would ever see anything so upsetting. Uh, and the only thing I could think of that upset me more was going to Auschwitz with Terry and Richard all those years ago in Poland. And I didn't think I would feel so upset again, but I did. Uh, because there, as I said at the beginning, there was a generation of people who had been lost. This is a story that Arthur told me that he was a young man, uh, an older guy that joined the unit. And um, he was only there for a day and he was he was killed on the first day that he that he came. And Arthur had spoken to him about who he was and what he wanted in life, and he said that he, he wanted a bicycle. I wanted to give you a bike after the war, just as you asked for, with a basket and a rack to shop for groceries. It felt sad to be the first one to ask what we could end up. And no, I do not know how deep the deep it is. But I do know, buddy, that the world we try to protect is so weird. Our last day started. When all the grocery stores were closed as luck would have it. Our last show I finished, the bicycle bell was ringing in my ears. This is another poem that Arthur wrote, and I'm going to ask him to read it because I have a recording. It's, a, it's called Soldiers. Well done. I was um, one and a half years old when uh, hope uh, came to, to, to be yeah. But there are many videos in the internet uh, from, from the days and um, you can uh, find it in the internet when on uh, seeking it's one of these two. Mm -hmm. Basically where I'm living, I went yeah, back yeah. to the church where the Pope was and... Uh, and there was a big meeting with Pope and... Uh, and Many young people, many children, and uh, when they were listening, Pope, uh, it starts to uh, rain, yeah. and Pope said in, in the Polish, uh, 
It's a complex thing to describe and understand, but the culture of Ukraine is actually being changed by the war. Um, and it was something I found very hard to engage with because uh, I had different conversations with people, but uh, people who'd been in combat said we had to stop thinking of the Russians as people. We had to think of them as something to be eliminated. Because if we thought of them as people, then our own humanity is damaged and destroyed. And that is extended to, to all manifestations of Russia, that the, the Russian culture has been excluded. And again, I, I found that difficult to contemplate. But it's a fact, and that's, that's the way it is going. When I got to Ukraine, I, I used one of the trains, very good trains, by the way, and give some story or something to aim for. Uh, but there was a video display on the train, and I noticed it was a kind of advertisement for the whole thing. Uh, women's clothing, uh, but they were showing a lot of traditional hair styles and contemporary takes on traditional clothes. And I thought that's interesting because it isn't something that we in Scotland, for example, have any, any inclination towards. Um, we seem to be stuck. And the idea of tradition is, is a different thing. I started asking myself what the role of culture is. Uh, I didn't really have much of an answer. And then I thought, well, maybe the role of culture is just to be what it is. Because life goes on and it has to go on. And not every piece of culture is about the war. There are many, many things that are happening in Ukraine. Cultural events that don't reference the war, although there seems to be an added poignancy. And this was in the theatre for the world and voice. Uh, I went to, believe it or not, I went to a performance of Henry Purcell. Um, 
which was um, a kind of art installation theatrical event with with music and song. First, I thought this is surreal. I'm sitting listening to yourself, and then I thought, no, this is normal. This is what what we need, what we should have, and it's normal for people to come and listen uh, and enjoy this theatre experience. Cemetery, and on the right you can see uh, the grave of Ivan Franco, who was a polymath and uh, lived at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, politician, writer, theorist, activist, uh, Ukrainian nationalist, uh, in a way a kind of author of contemporary Ukraine. And just next to him, his grave is the, the grave of a young woman who died uh, last year. Her name's Victoria Pandalina. I think you probably heard of what happened. Uh, she's a children's writer, but she decided to uh, to become involved in documenting war, Russian war crimes. And she was in a restaurant in Kramatorsk and there was a missile and a piece of shrapnel went into the back of her head, uh, into her brain, and she lasted for three or four days and died. She has a child. Uh, and uh, her old time was relieved, so I, I was there at this. Uh, at the grave, there was a, like a kind of plastic tumbler with some ballpoint pens next to the grave. People bring them and take them away. And she wrote an article, it's a very long article, but I'm giving you a very small part of it here. As a writer, I tend to think of home as the narrative shared by its inhabitants. People and places come about in stories Poets, playwrights, ancient prophets and novelists have all imagined the countries and cities we live in now. And their stories have greatly affected us in our relations with one another. But what story do we all fit into? My answer is complicated and straightforward. The only one story we can fit into is a true one. The true history of Ukraine is complex, painful and dramatic. And for a long time, no book reflected my family's experience or explained why I didn't inherit the Ukrainian language from my grandparents. Why didn't I, Charles Sutherland, inherit the Scots language from my grandparents? The decision to protect their kids, my parents, by raising them to speak Russian was inexplicable to me as a child. Growing up speaking Russian made me feel out of place. So eventually I had to write a novel about valleys like mine. My whole town of Aviv was the heart of the bloodlands. As if Timothy Snyder calls the lands from the Baltic to the Black Sea. I had to discover the great army killed thousands of Ukrainians early on in the Second World War. And that around 100,000 Jewish citizens of Lviv perished in the same period. This is a painting in the National Galleries. Um, as I said, the permanent collection had been removed, but there were, 
was a temporary exhibition. And one of them is uh, Yuri Shapovalov, Full of Pain I Am Hope, and it shows what the Russians did to, not to people, but they did to the farm animals. And it's, it, it's, it seemed indescribable to me, indescribable. I just couldn't deal with it really. Uh, I hesitated to include this in the lecture, but I decided it was better to do it than not. Um, I gave a lecture at the National Academy of Art, uh, probably an audience about this size, but different demographic. They were all young people um, in their 20s, students, one or two staff. Uh, and the lecture was broadly what you've seen today, broadly. There were some differences, but not that different. Uh, the day before I left Ukraine, I got an email from somebody who had been in the lecture. Uh, I won't mention her name, but she was not Ukrainian. And she wrote to me about your lecture. I needed a few days to digest. To tell you the truth, I was uncomfortable and upset. First of all, I have to say that I'm really sensitive and uncompromising about something, so sorry in advance if my words hurt you in any way. It's a bit like telling somebody I'm going to punch you in the face and then before they punch you in the face. Anyway, I was expecting a lecture about art in Scotland. I was expecting a lecture, as I understand it, and as it is more, even more necessary for art academy students in this context, a lecture is something we give, like food for the mind, new questions for a better understanding of the world, new ideas, discovery, etc. I didn't expect that you would change your lecture at the last moment to switch on a sensitive topic, but also a tricky one, tricky because I think what you talked about in your lecture belongs more to the people you were talking to than to you. Sorry, it is not easy to explain in English for me. If I tried to say it more simply, I saw someone who was talking about his own questions and feelings about a war that he is living from 3,000 kilometers away and sharing his questions about the situation in Ukraine with people who are actually going through this war in many different ways for 623 days. What did this bring to the audience? Talking about how Scottish people, as they are living isolated on an island, were seeing Ukraine as some shitty, retarded country is a Scottish problem for me. What this problem brings to the audience, what is the point? Showing a picture of a Ukrainian poet who died because of the war, inviting students to go to a concert and they have saying that war is horror, but Vladimir didn't receive the bicycle. His name wasn't Vladimir, by the way. Didn't receive the bicycle because he died in the war. What did this bring to the students or the people who were attending the lecture? I personally found it inappropriate and reductive. Also, I heard the questions you put on the table, and I thought that that was basic questions that Academy's teachers were already working on or talk about. I felt like it was a disrespect, disrespectful for the teachers. In my point of view, the lecture looked a bit like everybody was waiting for someone from abroad to talk about some things, but no, nobody was waiting for some person from abroad to talk about what he talked about. It is also, for me, underestimating the work of the teachers. I was glad that you tried to open the discussion at the end, but when following your questions as you tried to explain the difficulties about doing art during war, one part of your reply was something like, artists or people had to go through much more terrible things before you. This, con this reply in this context, I don't see anything good in it. The impact of our words is important, but even more in this context. 
As a person, an artist who tries to understand things and who spends most of my time challenging my own point of view and working on being humble, as humble as the grain of sand I appear to be in this universe. I know that we need time to learn. We are judgmental even when we are full of good intentions and we can be disrespectful even when we want to be helpful. Uh, this is the end of the lecture, but uh, this is a, a poem I wrote, somehow influenced by that last comment and uh, some other experiences. It's called Heart, Heart. At the beating centre of my hymn, I find my heart stain centred on fire. Winter nights we gather there, listen to the wind howl as it prowls the stack of inner heats. Whilst the corby, cushy, black, black sentence did the long. We're centered here looking ahead and he went to find the median line of our lives somewhere in the clouds. Dog star, pole star, bigger star. Where are we going? Nobody cares. And what a Haley, do we? I offer hope or fear. Fling out your questions, flash the thoughts to the universe. The yard's access is tilted, I want the tree, shoebly eccentric, I, Yates was wrecked, the rock beast slouches towards another Jerusalem, an uglier than was ever came before. They've been drinking before, and I 
looked at them and I, I felt a strange mix of emotions. I remember when I was that age and the excitement of, you know, drinking and the girls or whatever. Uh, but I wanted to shout at them, not to be quiet, but to, to say, look, um, there are young people like you dying. That's not in history, but now they're, they're dying. Um, why does our world have, have this weird paradox where we can sit in a comfortable room, maybe talk about such things, but we, we don't, in some ways we don't feel it, okay? Um, and these young lads, you know, I wanted to say to them, spend five minutes reading about this to your crack of before you get drunk. You know, it was the scene of mass murder. Um, and I share your concern, and one of the problems I've had with Scottish art, it's difficult to generalise, but it's been largely concerned with other issues, pictorial, uh, still life, colour, and very few of the artists that I've met or have come across historically have actually engaged. It's not everybody, but that's the general feeling. And I, I think the question about what art's for is it's a very big question. Um, but I think I share your concern that it doesn't seem to me to be engaging that there are too many pretty pictures and posters of place for beauty in life. It's, uh, we must have it. We must have that. The audiences you still got your mic. Oh, sorry, no. um, audiences need to be able to engage with the images that um, make them think outside of our pretty comfortable existences. And I don't see a lot of that being reflected in exhibitions or review. I do not you know, I don't really see it anywhere. And if you can't see it, you can't be it and you can't understand it or feel it. So well, I, I think it needs to be a lot more uh, when I was so, going, sorry, when, when I was going to Ukraine um, I got in touch with quite a number of media outlets, newspapers, and uh, I didn't get one commission. Uh, well, no, no, we're not doing Ukraine anymore, but I've got enough stuff about that. Uh, which illustrates the point I made at the very beginning, that um, people get bored and move on. And they weren't interested, and it's tragic. So then he said at the start that he reckoned he had about a year's worth of the world's attention before it just moves on. He was lucky to get that, I can tell you. Any other questions? My name is Alexandra Novaska. I am an artist. Uh, my name is Alexandra Novaska. I am an artist from Ukraine and also art director for Ukraine. Originally, I'm from Lviv, and I can been living here in Scotland for almost two years. And what I would like to say is like a huge thing for you because every single we are talking about it was really like a particularly what I'm feeling. Exactly, you showed uh, a lot of our culture. Of course, you. Um, have to, you have to show this dark part because we are going through the war and also I would like to say the big, big, big things. And it's not just for it, it's also about it for people from Scotland because, sorry. Keep the microphone next to your mouth. Uh, yeah. People is the main thing and we need to save and support people. And uh, the Maxim who showed that he was my he was my friend, and I knew him, and also Lesa Ukrainka with the show, the poem, who wrote one, probably was my favorite poet uh, from Ukraine, from past Ukraine history, probably. And, uh, and I, I would like to say in our schools, our children uh, learn the poetry of Robert Burns in Ukrainian, uh, they have a, language, like a foreign language literature. And yeah, so my daughter knew the poem in Ukrainian and now in English because she is here. 
And uh, yes, my, a lot of my friends, my generation, a lot of my friends, they are online uh, poets, uh, artists, a lot of them are killers. And it's really difficult to me now to visit even social media because all the time I just match it who just want. And it's really uh, hard to, to do something with this. I don't know how to figure out this because it's a whole generation of talented, it's very talented people. Like uh, the, the gene of your own age that just kill it, you know? And uh, so, uh, my not question, but like, uh, what about the thing? How to support young Ukrainian artists who are now trying to create their art in Ukraine? Uh, not just painters, also writers and uh, people from theater. I work as a work as a like, art curator in big art space um, in museum of Rory, the oldest Rory in uh, Ukraine, was in Lviv, and I work with a lot of Ukrainian uh, and local artists. And I know they just try to survive now because it's a war. So art is not the, like a main thing. But people need people need food. People need weapons. People need uh, how to pay for their rents, for everything. And I think maybe there is, must be some mechanism or something like, uh, I don't know, I just make a question, how to support this artist? Because I, I have a lot of my friends. I'm lucky to be here and try to like, uh, settle myself, uh, try to settle my career, art career, my creator career here. But to look back and clean, it's a really big problem how to create new artworks, because all the time they're under pressure of war, of the sirens, everything was going on, and they are really, really sometimes down, and after again, about after terrible news, not just from frontline, from civil cities, when civilians are killed, when you just wake up, and to be here, like it's one point of view, but to be there, it's totally different, and they just, fighting not just with enemies like Russia, but also with their depression, with, this, with all this pressure. And maybe maybe we can do something to support this creative generation, because they really need support. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stana. Um, I think it's, was it the Leo, the Lion Brewery? It's a... Uh, Brewery is a Viska Pilvania. There is a huge museum, they created a museum, and yeah. on the second floor they have a big art space, so I work with a like, big art curator. And, and so I'm in contact with them and with all artists from my city, so if you need some, I don't know, contact or something, they can, of course, they can help with this. Okay, um, certainly referencing the the comments from the lecture that I gave. Um, I'd like to hear your point of view on that. So, it's... My point of view, like, I'd be really, really grateful for this lecture. Because it's a... It's a deep... It's exactly what is going now. But I think we need to show it. And at the same time, I think maybe we need to show, like, you know, like some right part because that is not only what's going on. Because, as you mentioned, as a, Ukraine is a place for life, it's a great place for future, I hope. And also, it's like, a, it's like a magic. After all the terrible things, people still rise and still continue to live and still continue to create and still continue to do some wonderful things. So it's like, uh, for me, for me, it's difficult to understand because uh, half of me here safe and uh, trying to think how to live next years, and half of me still in Ukraine because all my family in Ukraine. I'm just here, just with my daughter, and I'm in contact with my friends. So all the time after some bombing or something like that, just write, "How are you? What's going on? I'm alive." They go, "Everything's okay. We are fine. We are continuing to live. We are creating something. We are." We are doing some exhibition. We are. Can you help us with this or this or like? Can you send us something? You know, it's like it's like a magic, and uh, maybe we need to also show not just this dark part because that this the hard part. Mm, it was pushing us to like 
to think that life is really valuable and maybe not to last for a long. You know, it's like it just remind us that we need to, to think about that we have a small part of time. Maybe tomorrow will not come. So we need to create for this time something. Thank you. If there are no more questions, if not, we'll, we'll end. Okay, just one more. Thank you. And I was struck by your comment that you felt it was a surreal experience watching Purcell being performed in the Louvre. Um, World War II lasted six years, and I believe for most of that time, Dean Myra Hess would just get up at the piano in London while the bombs were raining down. And she had no trouble playing the works of Bach, Beethoven, all the great German composers, Austrian composers, and so forth. Um, so that element of even then that there was a shared humanity uh, that came through in that wartime experience, did you feeling that this is um, completely absent in Ukraine because they are trying to fight the cultural appropriation of their country by the Russians? that they are excluding uh, Russian culture and how it is uh, interacted with their own culture and history. Yeah, I think the comments of Victoria and Alina made that abundantly clear. Uh, as, I, as I said, I found it extremely difficult to assimilate or understand that, that stance, you know, because Tchaikovsky or Google or whoever, you know, they, they have their world, their world culture, but that's the, what I was told, and that's what I saw. That um, there seems to be some kind of necessary exclusion, and it's, of course it's a tragedy for humanity, really. You know that we we tend culture that really had nothing to do with the present conflict, in particular. We, they they excluded. And many families are, are bilingual, but they, they, they don't. The bilingual, as, the Russian aspect of that is, is disappearing. The families are reverting to Ukrainian. Again, it's a tragedy. Do you think it would take a war to bring back Scots? <laughs> I don't know, we have more sophisticated ways of dealing with that. I spent 33 years of my life under communism in Romania. In the 70s, I served as a lieutenant in an artillery regiment in the Romanian army. And uh, it was very interesting because all the tactical schemes we had were defense against the East. As much as Romania was part of the so called Warsaw Pact at the time, together with the Russians and everybody from the Eastern Bloc. And, uh, but one of the things which they were telling us all the time is there's never going to be a war in Europe again. <laughs> and we thought, oh, thanks for that, that's great. Then 1989 came, everybody thought, oh, that's the end of communism. Then Serbia happened with the disaster we saw there. And now it's Ukraine. And I hope I'm right in what I'm saying. Ukraine is the death song of communism. This is the last jerk of the dying, dying heart communists who don't know any better. These people grew up, someone like Mr. Putin grew up all his life and developed as a person in that society. He only knew two things, domination and oppression. And it's impossible for them to get away from that. Once this is finished and over with, the world will be a better place, I hope. So good luck, Ukraine. And, and that is, I lived through the entire period of the Second World War. 
And I was so overwhelmed by it. Uh, it has never ever allowed me to forget the horror of it. But I also, being born in 1930, lived through the 1930s and knew that the war was coming. And I want everybody here to know that I learned that there, were, there was no difference between the First World War and the Second World War. There was only one world conflict. And it's not ended, as you say, and I'm so glad you pointed out that you're here simply because you had to get out of your own country, but you had to be trained to fight against the obvious, which was the power of that extraordinary aspect of Russia, which you have to take into account, which is communism. And it's a terrifying, overwhelming force that operates highly efficiently in certain parts of the world. And I lived most of my life in fear of the nuclear war, which had to come eventually, and it nearly did come in the Bay of Pigs, uh, when Russia was fully prepared for a certain time to involve the war, the, the world. This, this aspect of what's happening, it, it's not a war between Ukraine and Russia. And by the way, I think Russia is suffering, is going to suffer more from the result of this war. It doesn't matter how it ends. Um, because if you think of the Edinburgh Festival, the Edinburgh Festival benefited enormously from Russian culture. And I can think the high points were to do with the genius that, that is associated with Russian culture. I think the real tragedy is what's happening uh, on a frontier, which is not to do with it's not to do with Poland, Polish frontier linked to the Ukrainian frontier, linked to the Russian frontier. It's to do with us. And we are in such a dreadful state. And I think the most important aspect of your lecture was the fact that you revealed there was a stag party on its way to uh, Krakow. And Krakow, of, of course, was all about a place a few miles, I think 60 miles distant, which was um, like something I had to deal with in my life. And that was a concentration camp, which is amazingly dealt with in a very truthful and extraordinary artistic way in the rooms next door. And I'm incredibly grateful to this, um, this institution for putting on a show which actually ex extends the whole concept of this lecture. This lecture has come at a very important point, and I'm very interested that the Royal Scots Academy, the National Gallery of Scotland, would dare to have invited uh, someone to give such a lecture. Because it was a lecture heartfelt and from a profound experience, and it goes right back to perhaps, how can I say, the idea that I have felt throughout my life that the Second World War and the First World War have ended. We are still having to contend with it. And you are quite right in 
your comments at the end. And God knows what it means, but one of the things that I have to point out is that the culture that we represent is, to a great extent, about the misunderstanding of culture and the fact that we have nothing to be happy with in, 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 in our way of life. Because our way of life is slowly revealing our incapacity to defend the democratic principle, whatever democracy is. And so the battle that's being fought, the front line, is actually here. And I'm really amazed that there are so many countries, including the United States, that doesn't understand that. And what we've actually got as a way of life, for example, in America, is the way of life promised to the Americans by a madman as lethal and as dangerous as Putin and that's somebody called Trump. So actually our problem is that we've not actually yet learned the lesson of the Second World War or indeed the First World War. And so my life born in 1930 has been waiting for a bit of lecture this situation in this uh, part of Scotland. And I think it's very interesting the take that uh, this lecture was all about, really, which is that we ourselves have forgotten uh, what our national heritage is. And we don't even now, despite the efforts of people like um, McDermott, we don't use the real language of Robert Burns. He somehow is part of uh, the world of entertainment and that's why we have something disastrous like the uh, knees up, uh, which we reduce uh, our memories of Burns to the Burns night, the nonsense where we get wrong. The fact is, it was the Russians, so called, who understood the language of Burns. And it's very interesting that we're here and that we're in a, within a few miles from his birthplace. And throughout the whole, the whole experience, I was thinking, we haven't understood the use of our own language and especially that extraordinary poem, a man's a man for all that and all that. And it's very interesting, the Russians understood this. Uh, they took it on board so that he became a national hero. And it's very interesting, this lecture has happened. The man's a man, and he's the man of the day. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, I agree with you. Can I, may I just say, on behalf of the McLaurin Gallery, can I thank <coughs> everyone for coming this afternoon? It means a lot to us to have such a good and... Do I need a microphone? Probably not. It means such a lot to us. I have never heard the McLaurin referred to as a daring institution before. <laughs> and I really are. Thank you. Also, on behalf of the SSA, I thank you all for coming over here today. And also, I would like to point out that in the next room, there are three paintings by Peter Hausen, OBE, who I think are inspired by Ukraine. If you look at the reference of flags and pictures, you will see uh, he has attempted that. And I think that's uh, a very interesting gesture. And we are pleased to have his contribution to our exhibition in that format.